QSO Today, Episode 236, Richard Dillman, W6AWO. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the soon-to-be-released ICOM IC9700 all-mode VHF-UHF transceiver, and by QRP Labs, my go-to supplier of QRP kits and parts for the ham radio operator. There are links to both of these fine sponsors in this week's show notes page. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. My guest today left his home in Long Island, New York, to come to California for the 60s Summer of Love in the San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district. Once he arrived in San Francisco, Richard trained as a broadcast engineer. After a brief stint in broadcasting, he created the radio communications department for Greenpeace and spent 30 years there. W6AWO is the founding member of the Maritime Radio Historical Society that operates the Bay Area shore-to-ship coastal radio stations now maintained by the U.S. National Park Service. W6AWO is my QSO today. W6AWO, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Richard? Well, hello, Eric. Yes, I am here. Richard, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, Eric, for me, it was uh, practically since birth. Uh, my earliest memories are a fascination with radios and electronics and telephones. And one of my earlier memories is tying a peach basket to the back of my little tricycle. And when my parents asked me why I did such a thing, I said, well, I am going to be a garbage man when I grow up. And they said, son, that's an interesting career choice. Why did you pick that? And I told them the reason I picked it is that people threw out such great stuff, old radios, old telephones, which I would cart back to the house and disassemble and sometimes actually reassemble. Well, that's very cool. Did you, in your, with your interest in radio and telephones, did you ever become a phone freak? Well, I did. I was one of the... And I knew all the folks that had become famous in that field. Um, I built a blue box, and I think I may have built the only blue box that actually was vacuum tube powered. It had uh, oscillators, vacuum tube oscillators instead of transistor oscillators in it, uh, but it worked great. So as I recall, the blue box used... Um multi-freak tones instead of uh, DTMF, right, for uh, inter-office signaling? Yeah, that's right. I should have explained that. It's uh, very much like touch tone, except it's uh, different tones and a slightly different matrix. Uh-huh. And did you ever build a red box or what was the other one? Red box was uh, simulated coins dropping into a payphone? Um, we... we uh, actually did that, but with the uh, instead of the beeps that the modern payphones had, we actually had a set of gongs. If you remember the very early payphones, when you mm -hmm. drop in the money, it would, it would ring different gongs. Somehow we had a set of gongs and a little hammer, and we'd hit the gongs. So that's, that's what we did. But um, it was great fun, and really the interest in it, for me anyway, was not making free calls, but the technology behind it. And um, that's that's really uh, what the fun of it was. And uh, so uh, and, and actually the social part of it, uh, meeting the folks who were into this uh, was just amazing. And uh, including these blind kids who had to memorize all the codes and all the button pushes um, because they couldn't see them. Um, but they did it all, and one of them had a voice like a like a FBI agent or a drill rig foreman. And he, I watched him as he social engineered a switchman in an exchange to actually set up a uh, conference call in the telephone company exchange. Uh, it was, that part was just fascinating to me. Oh, that's amazing! Did you ever have a crossbar Stroger switch in your uh, toolbox? No, I never did. I I knew folks who had complete exchanges in their basements, and I loved watching that stuff work, but I did not go that far myself. So when did you get your first license? That would have been in 1958. Um, I believe I have the date right. I was about 14 at the time. And I remember then, of course, they had the novice license, 
this was in New York on Long Island, and you got to take the exam much as they do today, where you take the exam from another ham radio operator. So I did that, but those licenses, as you may remember, lasted for only one year. So then you had to upgrade or that was it for you. And that meant that you had to go to the actual federal building to take the exam. And that was one of the most intimidating things I've ever done. I mean, we took the train on Long Island into Manhattan and found our way to the customs house of the federal building and walked down this long hallway. And here's this door that says FCC on it. And uh, we know that a lot of radio men have gone in there and never been seen again. And so we go in and and the guy leans down over the counter and says, what do you kids want? And we squeak out, we want to take our ham radio test. Ah!" Mm -hmm. And so we did. And it was um, a very frightening experience at the time, but a great memory to look back on. And what was your first call sign when you got your novice? Well, it's an interesting point because then in the two-call area, they issued for the novice license the WV, Victor, prefix. So it was WV2BJK, and that had never been heard of before. And I remember trying to pound away at my very slow code speed and remarking that a lot of people were calling me um, because they thought I was in the Virgin Islands. And as soon as they realized I was on Long Island, they they lost interest pretty quickly. Oh, that's terrible. Did you have any Elmers or mentors that helped you along? We did, and I'm glad you asked that because it was an arrangement that I've, I've never seen or heard of again. There was a guy, um, and I remember his call sign, K2BKO, And he established an air scout squadron, an offshoot of the Boy Scouts, on the local Air Force base. He got a building. He got tons of surplus gear. And that's where all of us, who all of us radio-obsessed kids, finally had a place to go. And he taught us Morse code, and he taught us electronics. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful social situation. Uh, where nobody else at high school, of course, wanted anything to do with radios or radio clubs and was not really that popular uh, a thing to be doing. Here we had a place of our own, and his name was Mr. Baker. And ever since, I've always tried, whenever the opportunity arose, to try and give back a little bit of what he gave me. Well, it seems to me that you struck the mother load in New York um, with the phone freak friends and the ham radio uh, the, and the ham radio friends, did you uh, have a c- common channels or common frequencies that you would hang out on together? Well, the, the phone freak thing, of course, was, was much later. That was in the 1970s. I was in San Francisco by that time. Mm-hmm. But on the radio end of it on Long Island, uh, yes, there were, uh, this was early days. So this was before the use of FM on VHF, for example, everybody was AM and transmitters were crystal controlled with tunable receivers. So yes, we would hang out there and much, much to my chagrin now, as I look back, the friends of mine who were pioneering the use of FM and the use of surplus two-way radio gear had set up these extraordinary networks and repeaters, uh, unheard of then. And we who were just stuck in the tradition of what you normally did in ham radio just looked at them and couldn't really figure out why they were bothering with this stuff. But now as I look back, they were at the cutting edge, and I, I, I really missed out. I really should have been part of that. Did ham radio play a part then in the choices that you made for your education and career? Well, they did. I mean, there was just no choice for me, really, Eric, if it comes right down to it. Um, I mean, I I tried for a while to say, okay, I'm going to put this stuff aside and lead a non-geek life, but that just didn't work at all. So um, when I went to college, by that time, I was in San Francisco. Of course, I had come to San Francisco for the summer of love because I had heard that there were Uh, free drugs and hippie princesses, and that sounded good to me. So I left Long Island in, of course, a traditional DW microbus and ended up on Haight Street. But that's another story. Uh, (laughs) When it came time for, (laughs) when it came time to to go to college, I went to uh, San Francisco State and they had the best 
allegedly the best broadcasting uh, department in the country. So that's where I went. I, I graduated from there and I did put radio stations on the air in San Francisco and including our local FM station here where I live now in Marin County, which is north of San Francisco. So it's always been radio broadcasting, two-way radio, that kind of thing. That's always been part of my life. Do you have a, a great broadcast radio memory that you'd like to share? Well, I think I do. Um, we put the last radio station on the air in San Francisco. Uh, call sign was KPOO, amazingly enough, part of the Lorenzo Milam network of crazy radio stations. And we had absolutely nothing, I mean nothing, to put it on the air with. We had this decrepit transmitter that was on the top of a, uh, of a high rise on one of the hills in San Francisco. But the main thing is the studio was in literally in a shack on the end of a pier in the San Francisco waterfront. And we didn't even have turntables. We had um, record changers, you know, where the records flop down and right. the own arm comes over. It's just horrible. You stack and them. You stack address. all your uh, your vinyl records on it, right? <laughs> you got it. Right. So, and it would automatically so drop that, the that, record that, onto the platter and, and the arm would come out and play the record. When it was done, it would drop another yeah. one. That's right. That's what we had, so. So, but we had the thing on the air. It was on the air, and this was just um, not very far away from the federal building in San Francisco. And in those days, the FCC was supposed to inspect all new radio stations, and since it was just essentially down the block, uh, the inspector and his assistant showed up, and he threw open the door, and he said the greatest words that have ever been said in the history of FCC and broadcast radio. He said. Stand right where you are, Mr. Radio Man, FCC, <laughs> holding out his identification. And and he looked around at these guys huddled over this public address amplifier with a Radio Shack microphone and a record changer. And he told his assistant to go back and get a photograph because he's never seen anything like this. Uh, I think that was my best radio experience. How did you get? How did you get the audio from the end of the the wharf there up to the mountain? Ah, another great question. Well, in those days, the phone company knew what it was doing, and you could all, all call up and get a, a dedicated copper pair between any two points. And the trick was to get their cheapest copper pair, just what they called a dry line, just copper one end to the other, not equalized, nothing. And then the trick was for you to do the equalization so that you got good frequency response out of the line. Because if you had asked them for a 15 kC uh, equalized pair, you'd pay for the nose to it. So we did that. And then also another trick that was common in those days was what they called the phantom circuit uh, from the copper to ground. And you could use that for controlling things. And the controller, you mentioned phone switches earlier. Well, the controller, the remote control for the transmitter, had a stepper switch in it and a dial on the front. So you'd dial this thing and clunk, 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 down to position whatever it was, and you'd read the plate voltage. And, and so that's how we did it. And now this message from ICOM America. I'm so excited to be able to tell you about the new ICOM IC9700 SDR transceiver. ICOM had in mind the weak signal operator when it applied its DSP and direct sampling technology to the IC9700's receiver design, allowing the operator to dig out the faintest signals from moon bounce and meteor scatter contacts. The ICOM IC9700 is a tri-band VHF, UHF, and 1200 MHz transceiver. Operating modes include AM, single sideband, FM, CW, RTTY, and all of the digital modes. You can even use the IC9700 to talk on the local D-Star repeater, making it an ideal rig for exploring the amateur bands 2 meters and above. For the satellite operator, the IC9700 has dual independent receivers that allow full duplex crossband operation with normal and reverse tracking, and 99 memory slots for your favorite satellites. The IC9700 is beautifully appointed with an almost identical footprint to the IC7300. 
It will make a beautiful sidekick to your current HF rig in your shack. With its 4.3-inch color touchscreen, you can easily control the rig and find the band activity using the waterfall display. To learn more about the IC9700 or any of the other fine ICOM products, go to www.icomamerica.com forward slash amateur or click on the ICOM banner in this week's show notes page. And when you visit your local ICOM dealer to purchase your IC9700, be sure to tell them that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO Today. Well, it sounds to me like after the summer of love, you became a telegrapher with Greenpeace. What's the story behind that? Well, that's right. In 1977, yeah, 77, um, what was it earlier? 77, um, Greenpeace had originated in Vancouver and they opened their first office outside of Canada in San Francisco. And I didn't care about whales. Uh, I didn't care about any of that, but I knew that they had ships. And so I called up the lady at the San Francisco office and I said, please, I understand you have ships. Please tell me about the radio system that you use to talk to these ships. And after a little bit of a pause, she said, what radio system? And I said, I'll be right there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that started that started a 30-year uh, career with what we call the firm. And I built a, uh, a coast radio station at uh, in San Francisco. And lucky I did because the ships were not equipped to talk through any of the usual ship-to-shore radio stations. But here, just in the nick of time, we had this voice station that uh, was talking back and forth to them on on uh, upper sideband, on commercial circuits, um, commercial frequencies. Um, the interesting thing was, and here we tie into ham radio, that we had this ship in Honolulu, it, and it was it was horrible. It was a uh, World War II sub chaser, so it's like a very small, uh, very narrow beam destroyer type ship. But it had two V-16 engines in it. So the idea was that when we get into these chases with the Russian whalers and the Japanese whalers, they would just outrun us. Well, here's a 26-knot ship. We're not going to be in that situation any longer. But the thing was an absolute dog. And it took forever to get it ready. I mean, there were just horror shows about trying to get this thing going. But anyway, when it finally went out to sea, I had gone to uh, Hawaii and I installed a... uh, a ham radio. I even remember it was an Atlas 210X. I remember. It was wonderful little, yeah, those great little solid state radio. So I installed that on there. There was also a 100 watt um, commercial sideband radio too. And that's what we were talking to them on the commercial channels. So they're out there. There's a storm approaching. Uh, the rudder locks in the full starboard position. So they're going in circles. Uh, the gyro fails. It was just a horrible situation. And the 100-watt uh, commercial radio uh, catches on fire because the antenna had filled with water and the SWR burned up the uh, final output stage. So they have no communications. And I called up Ham Radio Outlet, and I said, do you guys have any used transceivers? And they say, no, but a guy is in here now trying to sell us one. So I said, forget it. Tell that guy to drive to San Francisco. I'll buy it. I don't care what it is. Just tell him. So <laughs> he shows up, jumps out of his car. I grab the radio. I throw 400 bucks at him. We hook it up. And then finally, we were on, now on ham channels. We were back in contact with the ship. So Greenpeace had its hams uh, that were uh, on, on board the ship as well as uh, in other places? Yeah, that's right. We depended uh, largely on amateur radio as well as commercial channels. And some of the setups we had on the ships were really impressive because we were just running. Uh, I mean, there was uh, an, and one of the ships, an Atlas 77, no, Alpha, Alpha 77. If you remember this giant amplifier, one of the first that Alpha put out. And the thing, you know, would do thousand watts it was just loafing along i mean you could just goose this thing almost as high as you wanted and the funny thing was that at night when when the crew was out lazing about on the deck and the radio op was firing this thing up 
the wire antennas would all glow with St. Elmo's fire. And that was really impressive, but it really did get the signal out. So how many ships? So when we... Uh, no, go ahead. Um, one of the great stories, I mean, you mentioned being a telegrapher. One of the great stories was that one of the ships, um, I believe the original Rainbow Warrior, um, went to Russia because they had a whale station, a whaling station there, and they were killing the whales and grinding them up, if you can believe this, grinding them up into feed for this mink farm. They were feeding mink, ground up whales. So we sent a, a bunch of people over there and they all went ashore uh, to do nonviolent protests. They were all captured, of course. And the ship made its way uh, left, made its way, headed back to Nome. And over that circuit, that was only Morse. It was on a ham frequency, but only CW. So it made it, in a way, even more exciting because you have these very sparse, to-the-point messages. And I remember very well my colleague, uh, Lloyd, who was the radio op on the, on the ship, and I say, Lloyd, you know, tapping it out, Lloyd, what are your intentions? And as he says, he taps back, our intentions are to proceed to Nome and less fired upon, So, which they did. And then that story hit globally. Every news outlet in the world wanted to be on the ship as they went back to Russia to, to pick up our folks. And these guys, these reporters had been everywhere, every war zone. They've seen everything. They were unimpressed by anything except seeing Lloyd in the radio room using Morse to communicate to San Francisco. That, they thought, was fantastic. How many ships did Greenpeace own? It varied over time. Um, it was anywhere from two to maybe three or four in the fleet. Uh, right now, I believe there are three ships in the fleet. Oh, that's pretty amazing. And you said you spent 30 years with Greenpeace? Yeah, I did. I did some early sailing uh, on the ships, and and in fact, that's where I was a commercial radio op on the original uh, Rainbow Warrior and worked the coast stations because that was the way to get a message into the telex network. And in those, this is well before internet time, so everybody had a telex machine, so you could send a Morse message to KFS or KPH and get a telex number, and it would type out there. But I quickly found that. Uh, going to sea was definitely not for me. This was for the kids, and there were plenty of kids who wanted to do it, so I retired from that. But I established what I call special services within Greenpeace, and that's where we did all the surveillance and spy stuff and any kind of infrared or aviation or any any of the out-of-the-way stuff that all came across my desk. So it was a just a wonderful, wonderful period. Um, of essentially um, conducting operations that were out of, not only out of the public eye, but out of Greenpeace's eye. And they, you know, I would just show up and be in a spy nest somewhere and have, you know, rotel room crammed full of electronics. And um, it was just, it was great, really a great time. Is Greenpeace now past its time? Or is it still a very active operational organization? Well, it's very active and has offices around the world. I'm not sure what the latest number is, but it's usually in the 30s somewhere. But, of course, us uh, old guys and old girls who were there at the time that we think were the golden years um, look around now, and what we see is a bunch of people sitting at desks. But... I'm sure that's unfair. Uh, they're probably just as dedicated as we were. They're probably just as willing to put themselves on the line as we were. And it just seems to us that maybe it it's, doesn't quite have the edge that it did. But then again, we were young, and uh, it just seems like it was a, a better time back then. But the organization, I'm sure, is, is still very effective around the world. When I Googled Richard Dillman... The biggest reference that came from Google was the Maritime Radio Historical Society and its amateur radio station, K6KPH. What is the Maritime Radio Historical Society, and how did you become involved in it? 
Well, I was one of the founders. Um, we knew of station KPH, and in fact, I had been a visitor to that station since the early 70s, so I got to see it when it was in full operation. And just to fill out the picture for our listeners here, KPH was a very powerful ship-to-shore Morse code radio station uh, tracing its origin way back to the 19-teens, 1914 to be exact, and even farther than that, going back to 1905 for the original Marconi call sign uh, of this station that was established in San Francisco in 1905 as a ship-to-shore radio station, Morse code radio station. So it evolved over years to become more powerful, to use tube transmitters instead of spark, to increase power and all the rest of it that I'm sure your listeners can imagine. So the station was in full operation with receive site at Point Reyes and transmit site at the 1914 Marconi transmit site in the town of Bolinas in California. And of course, uh, going there is just like, in a way, going to church, because that's, that's, the, that's the place. If you have this stuff in your soul, this is where you want to be. So of course, my mind was just blown. I saw all this stuff, including what they called the point-to-point operation. That was the other part of it. Instead of communicating with ships at sea, it was fixed links across the Pacific to these exotic stations uh, in all these cities around the Pacific Rim, uh, Shanghai, Singapore, Tokyo, all, all around. And each receiver had a placard on it saying what city it was listening to. And by the way, each receiver weighed 2,000 pounds and occupied two seven-foot racks. So it was quite an impressive thing. And, and we have just restored one of those receivers and have it operational that folks can see when they come and visit us. But when that station closed in 1997, um, it, it was, I didn't work there. I didn't lose my career. I didn't lose my job like everybody else did because that was the end of the line. It used to be you could take your telegraph license, you could take your Viberplex key and go to work at the next station whenever you wanted to. Well, there was no next station. That was the end of the line. And even though I didn't lose my job and I didn't lose my career, the emotional impact was so great that I could not force myself to go back because I knew I would see it as a, a trashed operating room like so many other abandoned um, radio stations I've been to. But finally, two years after closure, I and my colleague did go back. Uh, we talked our way past the guard that was on the door, and we walked down the central hallway towards the Morse code operating room where all my heroes and heroines had spent 20 years of their lives as professional telegraphers and before we even got into that room, I was hearing Morse code and static, and I was hearing ships calling. And I know the joint is closed for two years. I still get goosebumps thinking about it. We walked into that room, and it was like they had left 20 minutes ago. And the coffee cups were still on the table. Uh, the telegraph keys were still on the table. And they had te- intentionally left the receivers on keeping a symbolic watch over the airwaves as the last thing they did before turning out the lights and locking the door and walking away. Well, when, when we saw that, here's the ears of the station still living in Point Reyes, the voice of the station, the great transmitters in Bolinas, they're dark and cold, but still existing. That's when we realized we had our life's work cut out for us. And all we had to do is convince the National Park Service, which owned both sites, that not only this was important and worthy of restoration, but we were the guys to do it. And amazingly enough, I'm amazed to this day, they bought our story, and that was in 1999 when we started, and we haven't looked back since. Hey, this is Eric with this quick break. I'm a big podcast listener with over 20 podcasts loaded automatically into my smartphone every week. My favorite ham radio podcast is the Ham Radio Workbench podcast with George KJ6VU and Jeremy KF7IJZ. Every other week, George and Jeremy take a deep dive into their workbench projects that become boards and plans on their website. If you're a ham radio builder or want to be a home brewer, then be sure to click on the link to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast in this week's show notes page. Now, it's my understanding in doing research for this interview... I heard that MCI owned the stations up to that point for a couple of years, and then they decided to to get rid of it, and that the general manager of the place 
made sure to like keep the place cleaned up, as you're saying, and even trim the cypress trees at the entrance to KPH in order to make it look new and welcoming. That seems to be the thing that I think helped you decide maybe to join the operation and uh, and take over the management. Well, I, I, you're you're absolutely right. That last manager was Jack Martini, and he's been a supporter and a member of our group since we started. And I just want to tell you a little story about Jack is that, um, you know, people say, well, why do you do this? Why is it worthwhile? Nobody uses Morse code. It's just beeps in the air. It's an obsolete piece of uh, communications technique. Well, when we first put the station on the air for the first time, after it had been dark since 1997, and in 2000, we put the signal back on the air, Jack Martini was there. And the look on his face to hear that call sign again over the year, that was our lavish payment. Just he never thought he'd hear that again. And there it was. But you're right. It was owned by MCI in the last years of its existence from about 1990 to 1997. But for the vast majority of its lifetime, it was an RCA station and one of the premier stations, its sister station, WCC was on the East Coast, on Cape Cod, and it was KPH on the West Coast, although there were a lot of other smaller RCA stations. This was a major station. So for us, it was absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, we had been steeped in radio tradition. We loved old equipment, familiar with tube technology and wire antennas. Well, I'm telling you, Eric, this is like another universe, no matter how much you're into old equipment. When you step over that line, from amateur operations to commercial operations, it's a big step. And it really took us a long time to figure out exactly what was going on and how all this worked technically, but also completely different procedures, commercial procedures, because our whole idea is to make sure that the names and the techniques and the culture and the procedures of the men and women who did this job for so long are not lost. And we do that through actual emulation of what they did. Now, you said earlier that the station is divided into two sites, a transmitter site and a receive site. Are you sitting at the transmitter side or the receive side? Is the audio brought from one location to the other, or uh, you know, again, over those dry pairs? Yeah, actually, that's great to great question to allow us to understand how this all works. So the transmitters, as you say, uh, are all at the transmit site in Bolinas. So there is a crew of engineers there who tend those transmitters. And since some of them go back to 1942, and the only place in the world you're going to see a transmitter of that vintage, of that power, on the air operating on a commercial frequency with its mercury vapor rectifiers flashing away with the Morse code, that's a transmitter... Uh, department, that's the transmitter department's responsibility. So there's several guys who are in the transmitter department. It's their job to keep the transmitters on the air. At the receive site, that's where obviously the receivers are, and that's also where the operators are. So the actual communications uh, with the ships takes place there. We hear a ship calling, we respond, and go through the whole routine. The way the two stations are connected is a very interesting point. It was originally by the open wire lines that you used to see, like telegraph lines, and then became a um, multi-pair lead-shielded cable between the two stations. And I actually saw that when I first got there in the 70s. That was in service. And eventually, that enough pairs of that failed that they replaced it with a T1 uh, computer line. And there were actually two computer lines, uh, two T1 lines, one connected the stations from Bolinas and Point Reyes, connected them together. And amazingly enough, the other one went all the way out to WCC on Cape Cod because by that time they had attempted to cut costs by remote controlling WCC at KPH. So the operators at KPH had to remember which station they were, whether they were listening to the Atlantic or Pacific, and respond accordingly. But that's how the stations were connected. When the station went out of business, of course, that went away. And we're lucky enough to have clever enough engineers that were able to put all the tone signals that control the keying and control the transmitters on a single dial-up telephone line. 
So that's how the two are connected now. On a dial-up line. And does that dial-up line ever hang up? Yep, that's right. Um, we've had very little trouble with it, uh, amazingly enough. The the only real trouble was that one day we come in and we go to work as usual, and you know, you're listening to your own signal off the air. It's not like in amateur work where you have a transceiver and you're listening to a local tone. You're actually listening to your receive your your signal coming back over the air on a different frequency than you're transmitting on. Your so full that's duplex. Your side tone. Oh yeah, full duplex. That's the whole deal. Right. And in commercial operations. So so you're listening full duplex exactly as you say. And we notice now suddenly there's a slight delay on the line. You press the key and a few milliseconds later you hear the tone. Well that just drives you nuts. You can't you can't do that. And you know, just picture trying to report this problem to the present day phone company. I mean you would get nowhere. Uh luckily for us it just one day went away as soon as it arrived. But that was the only problem we really had with it. You know, on the amateur side, we've now kind of mastered controlling stations using IP. Do you see a, a, a chance that um, perhaps KPH would be controlled by IP? Not in the way that we think of it as amateur radio operators, but we do have the SITOR operation. That's in the one of the first error-correcting radio teletype protocols. On the amateur side, it was called AMTOR, and on the commercial side, SITOR, pretty much the same protocol. And in that situation, since it's an ARQ mode where the ship actually links to the shore and sends a packet and asks, did you get it? Yes, I did. Okay, I send the next one. No, I didn't. I'll send another one. It's actually linked to the station in that way. You do have to link the receive and transmit stations. And since we do have, now we do have internet connections at both stations, we're kind of toying with the idea of putting the SITOR back online. But that would be the extent of how we would uh, use that technology in the operation of KPH. Did maritime radio have an impact on amateur radio? Interesting point. Um, I don't think so. I think the wall between the two is is pretty high. It's just a completely different world. And here's a story to kind of illustrate that. The first uh, woman telegrapher at KPH, uh, Denise Stoops, she arrived there in 1979 after being uh, a radio man in the Coast Guard. So she had all the skills uh, that she needed, an excellent radio operator. She also had the, the salty vocabulary to keep up with these guys as the first female operator, but she soon found her place there. And she spent oh, 18 to 20 years as a Morse telegrapher, never had a ham radio license. So when we had the station back on the air, we brought her to the receive site, said, look, Denise, Here's where you sat for 18 years. Here you are at position one. Here's your bug that you used over all that time. Here's the receiver that you used uh, all that time. So sit down. Now, this was before we had the commercial side on the air. It was amateur under K6KPH. So we say, okay, call sign is the same, except it's K6KPH. Got it? Yeah, okay, I got it. You hear that guy calling on seven megs? Yeah, I hear him. Okay, give him a call. She calls him. The guy comes back with the usual ham radio response. Well, your signal is 599, and my antenna is high, and my transmitter is big, and I've been a ham for 500 years. And, and she is just looking in amazement at this, said, what is this? You know, because she is, all she has ever heard is time is money. You get the message next ship on to the next guy. And here's all this yapping going on. And she's just said, I'm done with this guy. I'm done, and turns off the receiver. So it's a good illustration of the vast difference between commercial and amateur operations. I mean, we're in it for fun on the amateur side, and we're in it for money on the commercial side. And on the commercial side, there's no such thing as uh, as lost time. You're just, you're just on it constantly. Okay, so you're saying something that um, that's actually surprising me. And that is is that you are still operating on the commercial side. That means that you have non-amateur broadcasts from the museum now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that is the big thing for us. Um, 
admit it, when we first started that and we said, okay, think of the wildest thing you can think of, let yourself go. What do you think we could do here? What we came up with is we could maybe get one or two of the KPH transmitters on the air on amateur frequencies under the call sign KPH, and that would be great. And of course, we did that, and, um, but we have gone so much farther than that. We decided we're really going to do we're going to have to do it on the commercial side. So for that, of course, you need a commercial co-station license. And it took us at least a year to get the gumption to apply for that license. And we'd say, well, I mean, here's the Form 605. You fill it out. But you can't do that. Well, why not? Well, I don't know. Well, nobody's done it in 40 years. Heads will explode in Washington if you do it. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. So we finally did. We had very good guidance from a person we had found at the FCC. You know, check this box, but not that one. We send in the form 605, comes back our commercial license with the call sign KSM. And we have medium frequency and high frequency channels on the license. And from there, we just expanded it, added more channels, added more, um, added more emissions uh, types like SITOR. But still, we were operating, we were operating full commercial channels on medium freak, four, six, eight, 12, 16, and 22 megs uh, Morse on the commercial side. But it was KSM, not KPH, because the KPH license had been sold when the station closed. That was the valuable entity that they sold. Well, finally, after years and years of negotiation, I finally got the return of the KPH license um, to us. We don't own it but we were able to operate using that call sign and those original frequencies. So now we're back on the air on the original commercial KPH frequencies from medium freak all the way up to 22 megs and signing the original KPH call sign. And even more moving and impressive than that, the guy who sent the last message in 1997, Ray Smith, again, a Morse operator who's never been a ham, he sent the last message saying, fair winds and following seas were closing down. Well, he was there sending the reopening message using the same key at the same operating position when we finally got KPH itself back on the air in March two years ago. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own home brew designs. Be sure to browse Han's entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. So that begs the question, if Morris Code is dead or is dead from the commercial standpoint, who, who are your customers? Who are you talking to out there? Yep. Uh, again, excellent question. There, believe it or not, there are ships using Morse, very few, as opposed to the hundred ships you would talk to in an eight-hour shift uh, when the station was fully operational. We get two or three, or on an extraordinarily good day, we'll get four ships. And these are, the majority are uh, restored World War II ships that have restored their radio room along with the ship itself. So they have the all the, the radio console is there, and, and they call us and uh, file messages. Uh, some are ships, pleasure boats, that guys have licensed for commercial Morse operation. And by the way, this is easy to do. If any listeners want to try that and uh, communicate with KPH, they can do it. So we've got everything from sailboats to everything else. And then one of our guys has recently started sailing as a radio electronics officer on uh, Matson line ships, so he will give us a call and file Anders, which is a, a weather and position report, and file messages with us. 
So, of course, it's not a money-making proposition anymore, but we do really feel that we're keeping the faith and following the thread and, and keeping it alive. And then, of course, on the broadcast side, we send press and weather, just as the station always did. So there are many shorebound listeners all around the world who wait for those broadcasts and listen for them. How do you fund this operation? Uh, yes. Well, we fund it out of our own pockets. We fund it um, by donations from folks who think that what we're doing is worthwhile and they will send us a check or donate online, and uh, we are eternally grateful to them. And then occasionally the National Park Service, which, as I mentioned, is the actual owner of all of this stuff, so it belongs to the people of the United States of America, they will come up with budgets for a particular project. So right now we're administering a budget for antenna repair and restoration, which is by far the most challenging thing uh, that we have to deal with. Here on the coast, uh, with the salt air and the corrosion, it's it's very difficult to keep these antennas maintained. But they have funded that. Uh, we kicked in a large uh, portion of money from our own bank account to help support that. So that, in a nutshell, is how the funding works. And as a national park, uh, the grounds and stuff are, are maintained uh, like the White House? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, of course, that's a very big contribution on the part of the National Park Service. Uh, and even bigger, in, in addition to maintaining the buildings, they pay the electricity bill, which at the transmit site, you can imagine, is, right. is not something we would ever be able to fund. So that's a very big piece right there. What is the Night of Nights event at the museum? Well, on uh, July 12th, 1999, now this is after KPH had closed at Bolinas and Point Reyes, and the license was sold to the competing um, company, Globe Wireless. And so they had the license and they had activated their own transmitters on the KPH channels, trying to get the last bit of money out of the Morse code and the SITAR operation. But finally, the writing was on the wall on July 12th, 1999, they had a ceremony for the last transmission of commercial Morse messages. And I was there. They even let me send some of the last messages, amazingly enough. Denise was there. Denise, the first tele female telegraph operator at the station. She's dressed in black because she's going to a funeral. You look around the room, and here are these hard-bitten old buzzers, these old guys that have been radio officers at sea for 40 years, been on every ocean there is, seen everything. Tough tough old birds, and they're weeping. And I, I was weeping too, because here it is, the end of the era. We send these last messages, and then it's silence. And we said at that point, that's not going to happen. We're not going to allow this to take place. That's when we made that visit up to the receiving station and saw that the receivers were still on after that, after that ceremony. So every year after that, to symbolically pick up the thread and carry on the tradition and say, no, we are continuing to hold this as an important part of our communications history. Every year on July 12th, we have this big ceremony. Now, we're on the air every weekend, but July 12th, that's the big one. That place is just jammed with people. It's amazing to me. I mean, the receive site is way out in the sticks, and people who don't care about Morse code at all will come out there just because they get the tradition and they get the drama and they really love the whole thing. So that's a big annual event. It's a catered event. All of our listeners are invited to come. What kind of license do you need to operate KPH? Yeah, it's one of the few places still around where you need a commercial radio telegraph license. Uh, they used to come in, in three flavors, uh, first, second, and third. Um, we all had second-class radio telegraph licenses because you need the uh, 12 months endorsement to go ahead to the first, so we didn't do that. But then the FCC eliminated those class distinctions, and now there's only one. There's one radio telegraph license, and we're one of the few places that give the exam for that. So if you want to get your commercial telegraph license, we'd be happy to give you the exam. What do you think the future is for commercial radio telegraph? 
Well, there's no commercial future in it. Um, I mean, these folks, these commercial businesses did everything they could to get every possible bit of revenue out of it. Uh, but there's no future in it um, in the way that we traditionally think of it. Uh, ships are no longer equipped with Morse. They no longer carry Morse code qualified operators. And that was a big deal. That's what they wanted to get rid of that radio officer. He's making big money. Get him off of there. So there's no future in it commercially. Uh, but we think there's a great future in it in the way of preserving this tradition and showing people how it was by actual operation. And in my mind, it's the difference between having let's say a tall sailing ship that's existing and tied up next to the wharf somewhere and actually having that ship abroad upon the ocean under full sail, uh, plying the seas. So that's what we see us as doing, actually doing it as it was done, uh, making sure everything is done professionally, all the logs are kept just as they were, um, as a way of honoring all the people who went before us in this profession. What kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? Well, um, I didn't get married until I was 72 years old. <laughs> That'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, that. that's good. It's never too late, is it? I, no, oh, that is so true. You just never know what life has in store for you. But um, I, am, uh, I am sitting in a wonderful house uh, overlooking the Pacific Ocean, because I, I finally I finally found my sweetheart and I've been married we've been married three years and um, and early in our relationship um, I um, put my walkie-talkie on the desk and I have a pager on my belt and maybe another walkie-talkie somewhere else on my belt and I said Catherine boom radio goes down on the table Catherine I like radios I mean I really like radios. <laughs> And she said, yeah, yeah, I know. It's okay. It's okay. So uh, we get along very well on that front. Um, uh, she called the radios, oh, you're getting another box with knobs, are you? <laughs> and um, and, and uh, so it's, it's actually worked out very well. What kind of station do you operate from home? Oh, virtually nothing. In fact, it's off the air at the moment. Um, I do have an ICOM 718 uh, transceiver. Uh, terrible antenna situation here, even though I'm on top of the ridge. And uh, really, uh, ham radio is is not uh, a big part of uh, my life. It's more the broadcast end of it. I'm the engineer for the local radio station, and we also have a um, two-way radio system for the uh, civilian first responders out here on the coast, which I am literally looking at the San Andreas Fault as I talk. And we have fires, we have earthquakes, we have floods, we have storms. So we have a network of non-amateur repeaters, and I think I've got over 200 radios in that network now. So that's a, a big thing that, that I do. Um, but on the amateur side, um, well, I got interested in DMR lately, and just to try that technology. So I, I did get a DMR, a digital mobile radio, and a hotspot. And fantastic, fantastic technology, very interesting but it's not something where I'm on the air uh, talking to my colleagues. And that's the way it is for most of us there. You mentioned that call signs aren't listed in the uh, website, and, and that's because it's, it's not really the primary thing for us. I mean, it's not intentional. It's just the way it is. I mean, you know how most of us, when we meet, uh, you'll say, okay, well, yeah, I'm Richard W6AWO. You know, you'll give me a call sign. And that's not it at all. I mean, I don't even know the call sign of a lot of the folks who are in the organization because our concentration is so much on the commercial side. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? Well, I've tried uh, a lot of these uh, digital modes, uh, FT8, uh, DMR that I've just mentioned, and I think that is just fascinating. I, I can't really believe all the work and the technology that folks have put into this, like take FD8 or the other digital modes, for example, for essentially no pay. And the stuff is so deep and so robust and so cutting edge that it's just amazing to me what folks have done. Now, it just happens 
that's not really something that interests me in the long term. I have set up stations to operate those modes just so I could get a taste for it and really see what was being done. Um, for me, Morse code is it, old radios with tubes in it, that's it. I have a radio here right next to me now that I'm restoring. Uh, that's more in it uh, for me than the usual, what we would usually think of as uh, the regular average uh, amateur radio operations. Do you do radio restoration in your QTH or over at KPH? Um, well, neither one. I am I am on the operations side, so that's where my skill is, such as it may be. The radio I'm restoring here, it's uh, unusual for me to be doing that uh, because that is not an area of great skill for me. But it's a fairly simple radio, and I thought, okay, I can I can do this. But luckily for us, we have folks who are part of the group who are – I. I do not hesitate to say the best in the world, the best anybody's ever seen when it comes to transmitter and receiver and antenna restoration and maintenance. And just as a short illustration, I mentioned earlier that we had restored uh, one of the point-to-point -point receivers, 2,000-pound receiver occupying dual-diversity dual receiver occupying two seven-foot racks with multiple modules in each rack. Now, we, one of our guys is not only astute enough to fully understand the very complex technology involved in this radio, but able to restore it, which he did. He took all the modules to his house. Um, two or three years later, he says, okay, they're ready. We mount them in the rack, plug it in, and it's working. Again, the only place in the world where you're going to be able to see, not only see one of these receivers, but actually see it in operation. What advice would you give to newer returning hams? Oh, and <laughs> don't hold back. Uh, as I said, uh, in my early days uh, in, in college, I said, okay, I'm going to try and not live the geek life anymore. But there was, there was no way out, no way out for me. It is, uh, th there's so much in ham radio and electronics in general that you can find something that's interesting for you uh, almost certainly, whether it's uh, radio collecting, radio operating, digital mode, remote control, antenna design, it just goes on and on. And it's uh, it's such great. And I I talk to some of the wives sometimes. Well, he's always at the ham radio club. He's always at his ham radio. He said, look, he's not out at the bar. He's not out gambling. He's not chasing women. What's the harm? <laughs> no, please let him have his radio. So it's uh, it's just. So much fun. Uh, there's so many aspects of it. Uh, the folks, by and large, are such good folks that I would say just just go for it. Well, Richard, you've been a fine guest. And as you may have known, when I was in San Francisco for Pacificon, I actually tried to figure out how to come down and see KPH. But it was the day that you guys were closed, so I didn't get there, and I blew out of there before I could go. So the KPH is my destination the next time I go to the Bay Area, without a doubt. And I'm, I'm urging all of the listeners that when they get to the Bay Area that they look you up and visit KPH and make a donation as well to keep KPH on the air. With that, Richard, I want to thank you so much and wish you 73, and thank you for coming on QSO today. Well, thank you so much. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Richard. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in W6AWO in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. 
I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.